Lord God, I thank you for this opportunity you've given me tonight to preach your word. Just guide me through this. Put the words in my mouth. If it's something that's out of my notes, just give it to me and let me, whatever you want me to say, I'm willing to say it. Um, just thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay. So the topic tonight I'm going to talk about is um, church unity. And it came about by us um, getting together with other churches. Um, when this Grand Caillou uh, softball came about, I thought it um, would be a good thing to talk about tonight. Um, because it's important to know who we're uniting with. And I'm going to go over that tonight. Um, the first, we're going to start off at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And it'll be verse 12 through 20. You want to look that up. It says, For just as the body is one, it has many members. And all the members of the body, though many are one body, so is it with Christ. <clears throat> For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jews, Greeks, slaves, or free. And we're all made to drink in one spirit. <clears throat> For the body does not consist of one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong in the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged all the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If it all were a single member, where would the body be? And it is there, or many parts, yet one body. So I'm reading, I'm, I think I'm saying this right, but um, this scripture has two purposes. One for the universal church overall, and one for the local church. And it all, each one of those can come out of this. But I wanna um, go back to verse 18. It says, but as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. So the whole body is put together by God for a purpose that he chose. Um, I can be honest with y'all. I didn't choose to be a church leader on my own. Or I didn't choose to be, be a, past, a future pastor or whatever it is on my own. That's all God. Because, I mean, anybody knew me two to three years ago, this would be impossible. I could not do this. I would not be, I would do everything I could to not do this, to bail out. And that's where you can't say there's no such thing as irresistible grace because I'm proof of that, you know. So, so God puts you, each person, where they want to be. Um, so I'm going to start off like, what's, what's the universal church? And it, it goes with this scripture too, <clears throat> that the universal church is all the believers in the entire world. But it's not what most people think it is. It's, it says all the believers in the entire world. That's why you have to be careful of who you see as believers. Because some, quote, churches are not in the body. And we need to be careful of who we unite with. And, you know, Pastor Dexter talks about this all the time, who you unite with. And then the same thing with the local and the universal church is each person is here for a purpose. Like God puts people in the church for a purpose, also in the universal church. Like James White is in the universal church for a purpose. He is to do apologetics and teach people how to do apologetics. And that's his purpose. You know, Vody Bochum has a purpose. Mainly the church is what I learned a lot about the church by him. When we went to G3, he talked a lot about the universal church versus the local church. So we learned a lot about that. And then 
man, manhood. He teaches a lot on manhood. That's his purpose in the universal body. Um, so there are many, many people who call themselves believers and are not. Um, these people claim to know a Jesus and claim to be followers. Um, if you go to Matthew chapter 24, verse 23 and 24, it says, Then if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, there he is. Do not believe it, for false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. And I remember we talked about this. It's not, it doesn't have to be a human person. Like, you know, they remember David Koresh said he was the Christ and the Pope, you know, claims to be the Christ. But it doesn't have to be that. It is that, but it doesn't have to be. It could be the false religions. Um, like... Like the Jehovah Witnesses, okay, they have a Christ. And that's, I think that's what that means is be careful because they perform signs and pretend they have a Jesus, but it's the wrong one. Also, you know, the Mormons do, Mormons do the same. Um, um, who else? The Word of Faith have a whatever you, Jesus somewhat loosely. <clears throat> that they say, you know, they use to get people in the seats and make them think stuff that's not true. Um, another one would be um, like the one that's Pentecostals. And we talk about that a lot. It sounds, they sound like they would be in the body of Christ. They make it sound like it. Um, but when you read up on their beliefs, they're not. They're not even close. They're somewhere where the Jehovah Witnesses are. Um, and I'm going to talk about that a little later on in this. So the, uh, the whole point is that we need to know who the real believers are that make up the universal church and who we can unite with. Um, so the first, okay, the true church is built on Jesus Christ as the cornerstone. So the, um, Ephesians chapter 2 Verses 17 to 22 says, it describes that. He says, And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So you are no longer strangers and aliens, which is basically saying to you, the church, the universal church, you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone into whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of the church. It's built on him. The apostles built on him. So Jesus first, then it's built on by the apostles. And we can go in Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 through 18, and see when did that happen. And Jesus was, in, was talking with Peter. And uh, well, he's talking with the disciples, and he said, Who do you say I am? Jesus asked his disciples. Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Borjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. So right here, Jesus is the corner, started the church, cornerstone, and started building on his apostles. So with Jesus as the cornerstone, Every word that he spoke in the scriptures is the foundation of Christianity. Everything that he said is absolutely true. Amen. Um, so I look at it, there's always these debates on, I don't know, it's dumb debates, but 
who chose. It's really no debate. It's just arguments on the other side trying to prove one side wrong. And um, I always get into these arguments and they want to say, well, in the epistles it says this. But I always tell them, you go back to the Gospels, the cornerstone. You read the Gospels and understand them. You get them 100%, clearly understand the Gospels. And then whatever the apostles said goes with what Jesus said. It fits together. They want to go backwards and try to make Jesus with the apostles seem like they said and then try to say Jesus didn't say that. And, and there's verses that uh, I'm going to use in a little while to, to, show, to show that. But Jesus is the cornerstone of the church built on apostles, so everything he says is correct. And the apostles built, built upon that. So I did that already. So there's no, no contradictions in the Bible at all whatsoever when you read it that way with the gospels built on the apostles. Um, John 3.16, I'm going to show you that one. This describes the universal church, and we, we should all know that one. We should. Um, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So whoever believes on him, and that's the key. I even pulled it up in the Greek. I'm not going to read it in Greek, but I'm going to read the translation. It says, thus indeed... Love God the world, that the Son, the only begotten, he gave, that everyone believing in him should not perish but might have life. So everyone believing, you have to believe in him. And I have to go to this verse. How do you believe? This is like my favorite verse in the whole Bible. It's even written on my shirt. <laughs> John six forty four. That says, no one can come to me, that's Jesus speaking, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. That's a universal church right there. The ones that the Father draws to the Son. And that's clear as day. There's no, no way around that. And then also in John 10, 14, 16, that describes the universal church too. It says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must also... I will bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So we'll be one flock and one shepherd, Jesus Christ, the shepherd, one flock. That's the universal church. So, so everyone who submits to Jesus as shepherd is one of the universal church, the flock, the elect, the sheep, all of those. Um, let's see. Okay, so to be in the universal church, you have to agree on important doctrines. There's beliefs that you have to believe. That are, and I didn't know that you was going to be preaching on that Sunday, but that's what, uh, oh, in the class, okay, okay. And um, I have some of those important doctrines that you cannot, that you have to believe. To be, to be the universal church, you have to believe these. The deity of Christ is number one. Jesus is God in the flesh. You have to believe that. If you don't believe that, then you're not part of the universal church. Just straight up. 
says, this is how you recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. First John 4, 2 and 3. And it's, it's saying that if you deny that Jesus is God in the flesh, you have the spirit of the Antichrist. It's just a follow-up on it. The next one is salvation by grace. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, I didn't give it to him, but it says, For as grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So you have to believe in that. If that's where um, Arminians, Arminians, where I think we can divide on that, because they don't believe it's by grace alone; it's by their work. Yeah synergism so that would be according to calm <laughs> that would be a um, divisive thing on that um, and then the third one would be the resurrection of Christ have to believe that physical resurrection of Christ that's a divisive issue because the thing Jehovah's Witnesses says that he didn't raise in body, he raised in the spirit. And actually, to go back to the oneness Pentecostals, they don't believe it either. I don't know what they really believe because the, um, their belief is that, I did a lot of study on them, but I'm just gonna go ahead and do the, okay. <laughs> I'm trying to, uh, um, their view of God is there was the father God, God was father in creation. At the in the beginning, God created the, the world, the heavens and earth. He was the father. And he was the father all the way until Jesus was conceived. Or I don't, actually, I don't even know when that happened. But somewhere between the time he was conceived and baptized, God the father left heaven, emptied heaven, and entered into the body that they call Jesus, just a created being. And so God the Father dwelt in Jesus and there was nobody in heaven during that time. So he was God on earth for those years of ministry that he did. And when he was done, when he, when he gave up his life on the cross, the spirit of God went to heaven and what happened to the body? I don't know. They don't even say what happens when he resurrected and ascended. So nobody wants to answer that question. But that's right there, this divisive. Um, the gospel. Um, in Galatians 1, 8 and 9, I didn't give them that either. I'm just going to read it. But if even we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preached, to you, let him be eternally condemned. Ouch. As we already said, so now I say it again, second time. If anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be eternally condemned. The gospel that Jesus preached and the apostles preached. If anybody goes outside of that, that's not good. What he says in there. Let them be condemned. Oh, it says it right here. The Jehovah Witness and the Muslims deny Jesus' physical resurrection. Therefore, they're outside of Christianity. Um, monotheism is another one that's divisive. There is only one God. Um, 
Trinitarian God. One God, three persons. That's a whole nother sermon. <laughs> but you have to believe in the Trinity to be considered in that. You can't be in oneness or whatever. Which most, most of them now, as far as like the prosperity gospel, most of them are going to the oneness. It's just Jesus. There's no, they don't care anything about the Father or the Spirit. I even heard one of them say that um, I don't worship the Father and the Spirit because they didn't die for me. Jesus died for me, so I'm worshiping just Jesus. I'm not worshiping the Father and the Spirit. It's like, wow. They missed a lot. Yeah, like Paul Washer would say, Andrew, how would you say it? That ain't how you say it. <clears throat> you know how we do it. We, yeah, we do it in the car. <clears throat> okay. All right. I think I'm... So the universal church is all of the believers. Every one of them from all over the world that believe these things. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. The apostles' writings. That's the universal church. So now we're going to go to the local church, I think. Or did I have one more? I did. I had 1 Corinthians 12, 27 and 28. I think that's the start off. That's the start of the uh, local church. It says, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, and then miracles, gifts, healing, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. But the bottom part, that's a whole nother thing. I want to focus on the appointed apostles, prophets, teachers, and those orders. And the apostles are done with, right? The last of the apostles are done. So now we have teachers, prophets, preachers in the church. Each local church was appointed a pastor by God. God appointed each true local church. That's part of the universal church, a pastor. Um, he is the under shepherd under Jesus as the, the shepherd. And I know we taught that before. So I said I'm going to use some of your, uh, some of your stuff in it that you use. So the same for the, that I just um, talked about for the universal church goes for the local church too. Just on a smaller uh, level. Um, so I'm going to go to Acts 20, 28. Start. says, pay careful attention to yourselves and all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which obtained with his own blood. So it says right there that the Holy Spirit made the pastor the overseer of the church to guide, to lead, teach. So the local church so the universal church has one teaching that we just went over, the Gospels, and the, and the, the whole Bible, actually, but the, um, the local church, starting in the New Testament, was built on Jesus and the apostles. Make sure we understand that, because that's the, the foundation of it. Um, so all the local churches have to agree with each, with each other on those close-handed issues that we just talked about has to agree with that and able to unite. Um, Titus 1.9 oh, says he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instructions and in sound doctrine 
and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So that's the job of the pastor, the fun part that we have to look forward to. But hold firm to what, is, what was taught, what was taught in the scriptures. Have to, have to do that. And it's sad, but it's not, it's, it's actually a rare thing now when you look at it. Pastors actually teaching from the scriptures. Or they find one scripture and just ramble on it with no other for 20 minutes now, I think it's the, the time, 20, 30 minutes. And just run with that one scripture and just talk about themselves a lot. Because <clears throat> I do, I listen to a lot of other pastors. It just pop in my head. I listen to other, um, I don't listen to the whole witness, none of that, but uh, some prosperity I'll listen to just to see what's going on. I listen to some Joe Osteen just to see what he says, and it's the same message over and over again. So once you listen to one, you listen to them all. So same thing. Um, but some of those, but also some local churches around here I'll pull up while I'm at work and listen to what they have to say. And, very few of them will teach out the Bible. It was the one scripture, and it's, it's done with, and it's a bunch of talking after that. Really, get nothing. There's really no teaching in it, and that's not what this says for the local church. It's not. It says to teach out the Bible. So if we all pastors teach out the Bible in the, the local churches, then we should all agree on the same thing. That's one thing, we, me and Cole went to G3 last year, and we really didn't learn anything new, because everything, Pastor Dexter taught pretty much everything they went, they taught, they taught on, we already pretty much knew, we were taking notes, but the cool thing is, there was pastors from California, Canada, Africa, um, Minnesota, all over the world. And every single one of them lined up. And they preached the same thing that we were being taught out of the scriptures. And that was cool because you would, you know, with all those people, you wouldn't think that that would happen. But when you're teaching out the Bible, it all lines up, everything. Like, I don't think anybody had any minor issues. It was all in agreement with everything. So, so we have to agree on those close-handed issues to be able to unite. Um, so when we agree with these things, we can be in unity and evangelize together. Because you have to believe the same thing. If you're working with another church and you're evangelizing, you need to know what they're teaching and what they're telling the other people. That's why I think with Grand Caillou it will work because they teach pretty much the same thing. I'm not sure if they reform, but I know uh, Pastor Mike believes in total depravity, so that's a, uh, that's a start. <clears throat> and really, if you believe in that, the other ones you have to believe in. So, so we can do that. So I feel in, in university too, I mean, you know the pastor, so we can get with them and talk to different people and they sh should be telling basically the same thing. So that's a good thing about being in an um, association. I like that. Either Southern Baptist or we're supposed to be all in unity in Southern Baptist, the same beliefs. If you uh, follow the Baptist faith and, meth faith and message. But, um, but there's no excuse then if they're wrong because you said this is what you believe when you, when you agreed to it. So we can do that and come together in fellowship, even just fellowship, you know. Maybe they might have questions that we can answer or they, we can ask them questions or if we need help, even with the new building, that might open up some doors for help with the new building with those churches. Maybe they can send some help. Yeah. So that would be a good thing to, to start. And I always did like that, um, uniting with other churches, like-minded um, churches because I see I see churches in Homa uniting with opposite beliefs like you're a Trinity church and you're uniting with the one that's Pentecostal church and y'all getting together and doing all this stuff but what about when the 
question comes up, who is God? Yes. If they even, they probably don't care about that. But if it would, then what are you going to tell them? This person's telling you one thing. This one's telling you another thing. And that would mess everything. And then you're confusing people, and it's just a big mess. <laughs> yeah, yeah they, both, they both believe in tongues, so maybe they can just do that. Maybe that might work. So we can come together, and we can reach more people for the Lord. That's a good thing. Because with Grand Caillou, I heard there are areas like Lower Dulac, all that area. Our areas for right now is focused on Ashland. So we can cover this, this whole road right here by uniting with them. And then we move over there, our new area. Then that'll be more people. <clears throat> and then they'll work on their area. And then, you know, whatever university will work, evangelize their area. So we can all work together. And uh, the university is cool because uh, Tracy goes there and his family. So we have to make sure, uh, yeah. My brother-in-law and his family goes to university, so so that would be cool to unite with, help that. That could build family bonds too, by that. So anyway, okay, got a little bit of time. So so uniting with like-minded churches, I think that's awesome. You know, and I just mentioned that not only for evangelism, but for building up the body of Christ. And um, the association that we in, um, that we can do that and gather together um, and build in bonds with, with other people. Um, same thing like with pastors to unite. I think that's cool that pastors get together and get in association and get to know each other, get um, questions, answers, whatever, um, whatever they need. That's a really good thing. To do and um, and in brotherly love, just to uh, to show Christ's love for us when we get in unity with each other. So I'm looking forward to uh, doing that softball thing. Um, I think I'm done with that part. That I don't know if there's anything that any questions anybody had. Something I said not clear enough or. Mm. Okay, I got one more thing to do before I uh, close out. Something that um, I will be preaching on October the thirteenth, the second one, the the second Sunday that y'all go on. Okay, um, let me give y'all a little preview. Oh, okay. Fifteenth, uh, give y'all a little preview um, of what I'm gonna be preaching on. The uh, and but while doing this, I found this scripture that um, fits to what I was gonna talk about. I didn't know. I read it was in um, Ephesians four, verses ten, and um, it says, "He who descended is the one who also ascended above the heavens." that he might feel things. So, speaking of Jesus, and it says he descended. Because a lot of the problems with, well, I'm going to say this too, a lot of the problems that we have with the, the churches that we're talking about, the, Jehovah, the cults, the Jehovah Witnesses, the Mormons, the Pentecost, you know, one is Pentecostals, is that they say that um, Jesus was created, that he just, came into existence at his birth. And he didn't pre-exist. And that's one thing I want to, I'm going to be talking about is that the spiritual side, nature of Jesus. But I found this, this is, fits real perfect. It says, he who descended. So where did you, how, you know, he had to descend from somewhere to get here. It doesn't say he was created at birth. The flesh, but he descended and also ascended. So, it's really cool. So, that, is that good enough? Close? Okay. Lord God, I thank you for tonight. Thank you for this chance that, to preach your word, 
to teach. Um, just thank you for what you're doing with me, helping me along this journey you have me here. And let's pray that it, um, whatever you have me say tonight helps out people and just brings more unity into the local church and a universal church. So just thank you for all of this. In Jesus' name, amen.